Professor Colin Rallings, we're listening to that here with me in the studio is Labour's Diana Johnson, Conservative Charlie Elphick and the UKIP leader Nigel Farage. Welcome to you all. Um, Nigel, let's talk first of all about your hopes then possible 11% national equivalent share. Um, you heard there Colin Rallings saying there's no clear social base for your support. Where do you think you're going to get votes from? That's what's fascinating. You know, normally new parties come along, they have a regional base or a socio-economic base, UKIP draws from across the board and there's been a lot of very lazy media talk over the last couple of years that, oh, well, we'll split the Tory vote. All we do is take Tory votes. And I've always insisted that's not the case. I think Eastleigh really rather proves the point. Lots of money has been spent. Lord Ashcroft, in particular, spent a lot of money working out where did the UKIP vote come from? How did we get 28%? What we found was that a third of the votes came from the Tories. A third of the votes came from the Lib Dems. 20% of the votes came from Labour, and 10% came from people who hadn't voted for anybody for 20 years. So the votes were completely across the spectrum. In the north of England, uh, we've done very well in strong Labour areas, in by-elections. Uh, really, I tell you where it's coming from. Ordinary working families who feel disengaged with politics. Given that, then, just uh, give me two things, then, that UKIP could offer as county councillors that Labour and Conservatives can't. Well, we wouldn't be part of national parties uh, tied to the idea that central government knows best because the reality is that county councils are now run from Westminster. Both, both parties say that they want more localism, don't they? Uh, so? Yeah, but they haven't okay. actually proved it. Second thing? And the second thing I would say is that our idea that on major issues that affect counties, that the opportunity for people to call referendums on those issues to really engage people um, in local politics, and that certainly goes down very well on the doorstep. Uh, well, you saw how giving people the chance at local democracy worked when it came to the police commissioners no, you didn't. and, and, and no, you didn't. local the government, mayors. No, because the government made a out. total haul exhibit. They held the elections in the middle of November and they didn't actually send out proper information to the electorate explaining what the elections were about. So when I, you know, I lay that firmly at the door of the government and I am quite certain that if we had the opportunity to call referendums on issues that really mattered to people, it would engage the electorate. Charlie, we have had Conservative colleagues of yours on this programme saying quite clearly they think UKIP is a, a threat to the Conservatives. If they split the vote, they may deny you seats at the next election. They may deny you the chance to win the next election. You're a Kent MP. Does the Conservative Party in your county have a strategy for dealing with Nigel and his party in these elections? You know, Or, or do you just cross your fingers and, and hope he doesn't head down your way well what um, we're finding on the ground in in dover and in deal is is not what you would expect i, it, I find myself slightly surprised to be reinforcing a part of nigel's point which is i'm finding that the conservative voters in, in my area are very strongly conservative and it's the labor voters who are trending ukip uh, and it seems to me that the uh, ukip offer uh, strikes most of those who are sort of wondering about their own normal party and thinking maybe I should look at something else. So it's a slightly unexpected position and I think many Conservatives fall into error in thinking the UKIP vote just comes from Conservative voters. It doesn't at all. And my neck but of it does predominantly so, doesn't it, on, an, on a national picture because Nigel Farage, you, you do reserve your bile particularly for David Cameron. So, oh, so but that's because he's given a series of lies on Europe such as four years ago when the Tories did well in these elections, don't forget Get, there was a cast iron guarantee of a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. All right, so, um, but, but, but Conservatives generally, nationally, are affected. But, Diana, just pick up that idea that Labour also has to watch its back, that UKIP could steal votes from you. Are you concerned about that? Oh, well, I think you should never underestimate UKIP and never underestimate Nigel. He's a very canny operator. But I do think that a lot of the support that UKIP have perhaps picked up in, in uh, Labour areas, there's a, a protest vote, and that perhaps in the past in the North went to the Lib Dems. It's now perhaps moving on to UKIP. So it's about a protest. And I think in the package, uh, the person who spoke talked about the kind of uh, a plague on all your houses the anti-politics vote, and that seems to be shifting over to UKIP. Mm. Oh, which uh, was one of the things that emerged in Eastleigh, for example. Yes, I mean, I do think, you know, after the, the last few years in politics, uh, there is uh, a view that, you know, uh, all politicians are the same and uh, UKIP seem to be offering something different. And I think perhaps people are shifting over to that. But, of course, when you 
drill down and look at actually what UKIP are offering and the policies they're putting forward, perhaps people who are supporting them may be quite surprised about some of those policies. Well, let's look at some of those policies, Nigel. I mean, for example, you're saying when it comes to home building, you want fewer restrictions. You want more restrictions, not fewer. Um, there is a huge shortage of homes, isn't there, in this country? And yet you say in your manifesto well, you want to stop unwanted a huge housing no- development. There is a huge number of empty properties in towns and cities all over this country. Um, I mean, certainly three quarters of a million empty properties in our towns and cities. And so we are certainly cautious about greenbelt development. Of course, we know the reason why uh, there is demand for new housing, and that, of course, is mass uncontrolled immigration. Nearly four million extra people uh, settled in this country in the last ten years. You're not going to cut immigration numbers by the 2nd of May 2013. And there are people, there no. are young families, there are people, never mind where they've come from, who need a home now. And you're effectively saying we're going to make it even more difficult to build these new houses. And we're saying let's have appropriate development on brownfield sites and not not allow um, our cities to sprawl on forever. That surely is good management. Charlie, um, planning has been a bit of a thorn in the Conservative side uh, these past few weeks, hasn't it? With the uh, Eric Pickles, the Community Secretary, having to climb down over allowing householders to extend their homes by up to 26 feet without planning permission. We've got the House of Lords tomorrow voting on an amendment drawn up by Mr Pickles requiring neighbours to be consulted before the house next door can be extended. Um, do you understand why many of your colleagues were up in arms about that? Well, the way I see it is you have, I think it's a, about one and a half million families in overcrowded accommodation. And my concern is that Nigel's policies are to stop giving them the houses they need on the one hand, uh, and his policies are also that there should be less social housing built. He has a particular downer on social housing and on 106 money that is needed for infrastructure. And I think most people would say we do need some more house building in this country in order to house the people who are currently in overcrowded situation uh, and look after the least well off. But the Conservatory, they're not um, new homes, are they? That's what well, we're talking I, I about think why extension. shouldn't someone be able to extend their house? Mm. Uh, and why do we have such a downer on people who want to improve their homes uh, and provide accommodation for themselves uh, or for their elderly family members? What about Labour's plans then, Diana? Because you say that you would have used funds from the 4G mobile phone sale to build 100,000 affordable homes. All very well, but it's a retrospective policy, isn't it? It's not going to solve the problem now. And, and why didn't Labour spend its 13 years in power building the social housing that people are calling for now? Well, of course, we are where we are. We're not in government at the moment. This is just Labour, because we're often accused of not saying what we would do. This is what would we would do now if we were in power. I just want to come back to this conservatory point, though, because this does have the whiff of the pasty tax and the caravan tax last year. When it was ill thought through, I think the planning minister, even his own local council said they didn't like it and when he was challenged about how many homes this would affect he couldn't give any figures so if this is a key plank of their economic growth strategy I think they're in difficulty it just seems to be again a mess and and rather a sign of the shambles that the government have when they bring forward policies they haven't properly researched. What was Mr Pickles up to? Well, I think, as I said, he was just in favour of people being able to extend their homes uh, and to conduct home improvements. And I find it surprising that the Labour Party are, are against that. I think there's a basic... No, we're not against pro- that. We're against, we're against this shambolic policy. We say a better way of dealing with this would be to have a VAT cut on home improvements and repairs. That's a better way of, of dealing with trying to get some growth into the building sector, not uh, this ridiculous policy around conservatories. I think the, the problem with the Labour Party is they're always for, there's always an easy answer to every problem, like borrow more to borrow less. Uh, the fact of the matter is the only way we're going to get ourselves out of the economic doldrums is to build houses, is to have more economic vitality, uh, is to actually live within our means, uh, and is to be on the side of well, hard-working well, people who want to do really means, well. Charlie, we? I mean, we're borrowing £130 billion a year more um, this year. Um, the fact is that, that the economics of this country are hopelessly out of control. I agree that Labour left you with a mess, but nothing's improving. But Nigel, you went into last election with uh, tax cuts offers of £85 billion and spending commitments of £15 billion. You had well, a £100 billion black hole in your last there election is a, there is, a, there is a huge degree of evidence that? that if you reduce taxes on the low paid, actually that money gets spent in the economy. And, 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 and that is perhaps a better way of getting the economy moving than government-initiated projects. Nigel, if we're talking about spending commitments, yeah. you've got an awful lot of them in your manifesto. And cutting, and cutting commitments well, too. 
Let me run through the spending commitments first well, of all. Well, try some cutting commitments. No, no, let's do because, the spending because every, commitments. Because everyone does Your this. local election manifesto, yeah. council tax should go down, not up. More on roads and public transport. Reopening rural bus routes, reopening railway lines, ending road tolls, reversing local government cuts to libraries and youth services, reinstate the student grant, etc. How do you pay for it? Yeah, I mean, these are aspirations. They're not specific. They're, they're, they, you know, the idea that we can cut council tax now uh, simply isn't going it's to happen. It's a manifesto, so but, people will but, think, oh, well, it's an aspiration. You can, my, it's my an council aspiration tax to will cut. go down. It's an aspiration to cut it. It's not possible to do it right at this moment in time. But what we've got to do Well, how is would you cut. pay for it then? Well, we've got to stop giving £75 million a day in foreign aid and in, in membership fees to the European Union, and we've got to, we've got to attack the £60 billion a year this government spends on quangos. Ex- we, need, we need tax cuts and we need spending cuts, and we're actually getting neither at the moment. Uh, you want to set up more quango-type organisations, though, don't you? Because you say that you want to set up boards at a county council level to run health and education. Now, I can't get my head around that because you say at the one hand, you know, you want to get away from this centralised system and yet here you are, you want to set up another layer of bureaucracy and change things like the health service, which has already gone through a massive reorganisation. No, 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 the same people can do it. I mean, the idea would be... And, and, and had the police and crime commissioners thing gone better, and it didn't, sadly, the idea would be that actually we would inject an element of local democracy into, into the health service as well. And that, I think, would be desirable. But I, I'm afraid the PCC thing has gone so badly um, that that is some years down the road now. Mm. Um, I still think that it needs a bit more clarity because you, you talk about cutting money to the EU, but of course we are yeah. talking about a manifesto for now. And yeah. if, if these are just aspirations and you're talking about those sort of long-term ways of spend, of paying for your spending commitments, that implies that you're not seriously trying to get county councillors elected for these elections in oh, less no, than a fortnight's are, time no, no, because no, are, no, then no, you would have to see through your no, policies. No, we are. And in fact, if you look at the manifestos of the other parties, there's almost no macroeconomics in it at all. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a funny question, isn't it? Are the three, are the four parties campaigning on local issues or national issues? And the truth is, it's a bit of both. Well, let's have a little look then at, uh, at what you would do at, uh, at local level um, Labour councils that you're, you're seeking to gain. Uh, for example, um, county council cuts. What about police numbers? Because that's an issue that is relevant in these county council elections. And, and Labour has said that um, it would stick with certain levels of spending. What about cutting more police? Are you going to say, well, yeah, we have to accept that? Well, we always said that um, we recognise 12% cut to uh, the police budget was was workable and HMIC Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary said you could do that, it would be difficult but you could protect the front line. What we've seen now we're under the current government is 20% cuts and we, we know there's going to be about 15,000 front line officers gone during this parliament so clearly police numbers are a key issue and people feeling safe and secure in their own communities. We know that lots of councils are concerned about this, we now obviously have these PCCs the Police and Crime Commissioners and they have responsibility for for police budgets and I imagine there'll be quite a few of those who will be making very strong representations to Theresa May about the budgets they've been given and the police numbers. The big question though is whether you would reverse the government's cuts to local government. around local government, well, we're not making any clear uh, promises because we don't know what the situation is in, will be by 2015. We know the economy is still flatlining. And that's flat-lining. the frustration, isn't it? And it because is frustrating, yes, but it would be you'd wrong. You'd love to go out on the doorstep, wouldn't would you, and wrong. say what you're going to do? Well, it would be wrong to say now where we'll be in two years' time. Hopefully the economy will improve, but the signs are, when we get the growth figures this week, that the, the economy is going to continue in this, uh, this flatlining state, but which doesn't help us in terms of then providing additional funds to local government and health and education. And if you say the coalition's cutting too deep and too fast, why can't you just say, look, we would do it differently? Well, we, we did say we would do it differently. As I explained, our policy was 12% cuts to the police. That was what we said we would do, and we, we had the support of HMIC on that. So I don't think we've backed away from making difficult choices. Charlie, do you think the Conservatives will need to be up front with voters in these elections and tell them if the Conservatives win the next general election, local councils are again going to suffer big cuts in spending? Well, we have been very upfront about the situation the country is facing. It's a very difficult economic situation. We are upfront that there are no easy answers. 
Uh, and it seems to me that UKIP's economic policies would take us away of Greece and Cyprus with lots of unfunded spending commitments and tax cuts. That's and pretty uh, rich from a government that's borrowing £130 billion pounds well, a year more would, than it's earning, well, isn't it? That, and failed on every single objective it set out in 2010. You would <laughs> massively increase borrowing we and take this country going. to the wall. You say you would take get growth going. It's the same policy as the Labour Party, who also says, let's just borrow more to borrow less. We well, have to live... We have that's to, the problem. We are getting the deficit down. We've got the deficit down by a third. We've got You're a million more. new private sector jobs. We've kept interest rates low. You're borrowing low. more, 245 million sure, more than you plan. We've made sure that you know, the country is stabilised after the train wreck mm. that Labour left us. It's not been easy. But the, I, the IMF, worried. though, have not um, necessarily mm. been endorsing the current policy. We heard the discussion there with Rob Hutton, the IMF saying, look, you may have to change your position and you may have to start changing the plans that were set. We, we have done that and we use the strength of the nation's balance sheet, hard won uh, f- fiscal credibility, to do infrastructure guarantees to help get Britain moving. It's those sorts of practical, realistic policies that will help get the country going, not just borrowing more for some short-lived, half-baked economic stimulus. Nigel, what about infrastructure? Because, again, you know, looking at your manifesto, you say you want less red tape, but you do want to be able to put more obstacles in the way of out-of-town supermarkets, don't you? Energy <coughs> developments, you know, big energy projects... And, well, waste. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about the, the vast waste of money on wind turbines, yes, we're opposed to but, them. But, you know, out of town supermarket building would provide a lot of jobs and investment. Um, if you're saying we don't want that, you could be perceived as not necessarily a part of, party of growth and enterprise, but a, a sort of party of nimbus. Well, it depends a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, HS2 is going to cost the government £32 billion. I do not see an economic case for HS2, and I would have thought that we could spend a third of that money upgrading train services all over Britain for the benefit of many millions of people, not just a few very wealthy commuters. So I think, you know, there is a practical approach to this. We we are far from being anti-business, we're pro-business. The point about the out-of-town developments is we're actually witnessing the death of our towns and high streets, and someone needs to think about that. Charlie, what about HS2? Where do you stand on that? Well, the way I say it is Nigel is just opposed to everything. Against HS2, against out-of-town development. Wind turbines. Against against, wind turbines. Which are useless, uh, expensive and tax the poor. Absolutely wrong, Nigel. Absolutely wrong. Biggest con job I've seen in the whole of my life. The voice of angry England against any form of progress whatsoever. (laughs) Well, if you think wind turbines are progress, (laughs) history will prove you wrong. Hold on, hold on. If you want to get economic growth going, renewables and offshore wind turbines is a really positive way this economy could get some growth into it. Manufacturing in the north of England closing down as a well, result of green taxes Hull, and expensive energy. We want energy. Siemens to come and manufacture wind turbines in Hull. We know that we are well placed if Siemens come to bring in a whole supply chain following it. That's a way of getting growth into the regions and into the national economy. Four jobs as well. lost in the real economy for one producer in the full And we need a different economy. energy source. We can't H- re- rely on coal and, and gas and oil forever. We need to look at alternatives. You're being very short sighted, well, Nigel. Work, Hang on. Not wind. They do. Can work. I get a word in here, please? Sorry. HS2, Charlie, are you in favour? I have to say, HS1, which runs <laughs> HS2, uh, through Kent... Well, no, 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 HS1, which runs through Kent, was massively opposed and has been an enormous success. It's been transformative for Kent. And I have to say, HS2, um, we should look at what's happened to HS1 and not just reject it out of hand, as Nigel does. HS1 was built alongside the existing track and motorway. HS2 is going on a completely separate part of the countryside, is costing a vast amount of money and isn't needed. Right. We're going to have some interesting talks on the doorstep, aren't we, over the next week or so. Nigel Farage, Charlie Elphick, Diana Johnson, thanks all very much indeed.